Confrontation is not something that very many people enjoy. In fact, I would say if you enjoy confrontation, you probably have some sort of a spiritual problem. <laughs> I know lawyers and district attorneys and such need to be combative a little bit, and that goes with the territory, but more than likely, that's not the case. And there's so much in Scripture that we read about forbearing one another and forgiving one another and being patient with one another and about making every effort as Paul says, to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Now, we don't like to think about confrontation. But the fact is, there are times when confronting another brother or sister in Christ becomes absolutely necessary. For one thing, it's necessary when someone is willfully sinning and continuing on in that sin that we have a need and a duty, as Jesus tells us in Matthew 18, to go to that brother or that sister uh, and talk to them and, and, and do what's necessary, then possibly take somebody with you if that doesn't work, and then in the end tell it to the church. There's this whole process that he lays out for that. But it's also true that when that unity of the Spirit and that bond of peace is being threatened, by someone within the church, then confrontation is also necessary. And if you'll turn with me this morning once again to the book of Galatians, chapter 2, we're going to see Paul describing a very serious confrontation that took place between him and another leader in the church. And it wasn't about Paul seeking to force his own opinion or to voice a preference, or because he was offended, or because he had gotten his feelings hurt. This was a confrontation in Christ, being done in the body of Christ, offering correction in Christ, and done in the spirit of someone who knew he had been crucified with Christ. And the only reason he's telling the people of Galatia about it is because, this light, because just like this man that Paul had had to confront, these churches in Galatia were being lured away from Christ. And Paul had to, to share this with them so that they would get the point. And what's particularly shocking about this is that the person that Paul had to confront was none other than the Apostle Peter, also known as Cephas who was a key leader in the church. And that fact alone ought to be a pretty serious warning to us all that any one of us is capable of being either led astray by some error or being pushed by peer pressure into doing things that we know are wrong. And so this morning, as we read this, and if we really understand Christ and his love and the purpose behind it, that we need to be willing to confront another brother or sister when they're wrong in this kind of a way so that both they can be restored and so that the body of Christ can be protected. So look with me, if you would, here in Galatians chapter 2 and verse 11, where Paul says, But when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face, because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James, he was eating with the Gentiles. But when they came, he drew back and separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. And the rest of the Jews acted hypocritically along with him, so that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. But when I saw that their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas before them all, if you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you force Gentiles to live like Jews? Let's just bow for a word of prayer here once again as we step into this passage and take a look at this. Father, we thank you for the precious gift of your word. Lord, we thank you that you have hidden nothing from us that we needed to know. <clears throat> 
And though, Lord, this is a painful chapter to read and a painful scene to contemplate, Lord, by your Holy Spirit, you moved your servant Paul to write this and to record it so that we would read it. And Lord, I pray that the Holy Spirit would speak through your word today, dear Lord, and that you will use it to to drive this message home to us, Lord, that you want us to see. And I pray in Jesus' name, amen. So what was going on here? And what was this confrontation all about? Well, as Paul said, this happened at Antioch. And if you will recall, Antioch was the church that had sent Paul and Barnabas on their first missionary journey. And as you go back and you read that account in the book of Acts in chapter 13, I'm not going to turn there now, but you can see that this was an international church. It was a racially diverse church. The names of the people indicate that to us. We have, you know, Paul and Barnabas are mentioned, and they, of course, were both Jewish people. But then you have a fellow by the name of Simeon, it says, who was called Niger. And Niger means black. And most Bible scholars believe that this was most likely a black man from Africa who was there. It was part of this congregation. And then you have a fellow by the name of Lucius from the North African city of Cyrene. And then as we mentioned a couple of, year, uh, a couple of weeks ago, after Paul and Barnabas came back from that first missionary journey in Galatia, they brought other Gentile believers with them. They brought Titus and some other folks there. And then that that whole controversy with the Council of Jerusalem that took place. But it was this wonderful picture, this mixed gathering of races and cultures that were celebrating their life in Christ together. And they were eating together. They had these fellowship meals. Uh, The New Testament refers to them as love feasts, I believe, in a couple of places. And apparently this was part of church life from the very beginning. You go back to Acts 2.47, which says, They ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart. These people enjoyed getting together to eat, and it was just part of the fellowship of the church at that time. And that was what was going on at Antioch. And then after settling that dispute, Going to Jerusalem and settling that dispute that yes, non-Jewish believers are just as much a part of the body of Christ as the Jewish ones. And yes, we're saved by faith and not by keeping the Old Testament law. And no, they don't have to be circumcised. And no, they don't have to keep all these dietary laws, which we ourselves couldn't even keep, as Peter says. They're fully accepted into the body of Christ. And there was this wonderful fellowship that was going on. And apparently Peter, after the, sometime after this, had gone to Antioch. And he was taking part in this. And he was sitting together and eating with his brothers and sisters from other nations and from other groups. But old ideas, especially old ideas about race, and distinction often die very hard. They often take a long time to die. That's what I'm trying to say. And as we've seen during the past few weeks, even though this matter had been settled at the Council of Jerusalem, and they had sent letters out to the churches to to share what had been determined, what had been recognized through the Holy Spirit, and that decision that, that I just described a moment ago, There were still people, and quite a few of them, who persisted in this idea that the Jewish people were superior and that the law of Moses still had to be kept. There could be no departure from that tradition and that in order for a person to be saved, he had to become a Jew and to keep all of the Jewish laws. And this was still persisting. And sometimes later, it seems that a group of these guys had come down from Jerusalem to Antioch, at least purporting to be coming from James with his authority. And it seems that Peter had been intimidated by them. You know, peer pressure can be such a powerful thing, can't it? (laughs) I can remember dealing with that when I was in high school and college and from time to time, even even as an adult, peer pressure can convince us to do things that we know are wrong. It can convince us to say things that we know are not true, simply because we want to please the person who is next to us, or the people, or the group that we're trying to impress. 
And I don't know anything about these people. The scripture doesn't tell us, but I think it's probably likely they were at least important looking. They were probably affluent. They carried some influence. And perhaps when they came and they saw Peter there, or maybe they'd heard about it from up in Jerusalem, that Peter's eating with the Gentiles. And maybe they came and they just began to scowl at him. Maybe they, you ever have somebody do this to you? They look at you and they, you whisper and, and maybe they pulled him aside and Peter, I, I just can't believe you're doing this. You're turning your back on the tradition of your fathers. Think about it. Our people for thousands of years have followed the law of Moses. And here, you're, you're, you're eating with these Gentile people. How can you do this? And Peter began to cave into that. He was intimidated. And he pulled away. And it reminds me of, of a scene from a movie called The Help. Maybe some of you have seen it really good movie about some of the things that some black Americans had to endure while they were working in white households in the South as household helpers there. And there was this one lady who had previously treated her, her, her maid, the lady who worked there, you know, caring for her children. She had previously treated her with kindness and respect, even treated her much as an equal. And yet when... Her social gathering got together at her house, whenever Ladies' Aid Society or whatever it was, when they all got together, they didn't like it. And they put peer pressure on her. They, they began to pressure her. They said, you, you, you can't be doing this. You can't, you can't let that lady talk to you this way. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? And, and, and they provoked her to speaking harshly with this dear woman who had been her friend for all these years and practically raised her own daughter. And even goaded her into firing her, which ended up breaking her heart. You know, the book of Proverbs tells us that the fear of man brings a snare. And Peter had been snared by the fear of man. In spite of all that he knew, in spite of all that Jesus had taught him. And the language would indicate that Peter had done this little by little. He gradually began to pull away from his Gentile brothers and sisters that he had been eating with and fellowshipping with. He began gradually to pull away. And the sad thing was, not that that wasn't sad enough, but that he was influencing other people as well by what he was doing. It says, and the rest of the Jews acted hypocritically along with him. So that even Barnabas, Paul's trusted co-worker who had gone with him on that first missionary journey, even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. And folks, never forget it. You are influencing other people. You may have no idea of the people who are watching you, maybe even the people who are imitating you. And seeing the way that you live and the way that you do things. And you can rest assured that when you make a decision, you are going to be influencing somebody else. You may not even be aware of it. And what happened was, apparently, all the rest of the Jewish believers had pulled away from eating together with the Gentiles. They had been taken in by Peter's hypocrisy and the fear of man. And it was at this point, when the Apostle Paul saw what was happening, that this was where he calls Peter out. In verse, 7, in verse 14, Paul says, But when I saw that their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas before them all, If you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you force the Gentiles to live like Jews? Now, Peter had given in to this very false teaching that he had helped refute at the Council of Jerusalem. And you might be reading this here, and you might be thinking, whoa. But Paul said this to Peter in front of everybody. He said, I said to them before them all. And you might think, well, man, I thought we weren't supposed to do that. <laughs> I mean, I thought we were supposed to just talk to people in private 
And, and, and most of the time, in fact, I would say 99% of the time, you'd be right. But there are two things that we have to take into account here with what was going on. One was the seriousness of what Peter was doing. He was wounding all of the non-Jewish believers in that church, and he was doing so in a public way, a way that everybody could observe. The second is the fact that Peter was an apostle of Jesus Christ, and he should have known better. He was a trusted leader. He was the one who had gone to the house of Cornelius, the Roman centurion, and told him, you yourselves know how unlawful it is for a Jew to associate or visit anyone of another nation, but God has shown me that I should not call any person common or unclean. That's what Peter had said to Cornelius. And Peter was the one who had stood up at the council of Jerusalem and said that God had made no distinction between Jews and Gentiles. And he said, we believe that we will be saved through grace of the Lord Jesus Christ just as they will. But now by his actions and pulling away from these people, Peter was saying, but there is a distinction. There is a difference. By pulling away his fellowship from these non-Jewish believers, Peter was undermining the unity of the body of Christ. And Paul called him out publicly on it. And though the occasions are rare, when someone is sinning in a public way, and they are leading away a group of people who, who should know better, and especially if it's being done by a leader, at those rare times, a public rebuke may be in order. And in fact, Paul wrote to Timothy, he said, do not admit a charge against an elder except on the evidence of two or three witnesses. This is something you need to be very careful about. But, he said, as for those who persist in sin, rebuke them in the presence of all so that the rest may stand in fear. And so most of the time, going to someone in private is indeed the right thing to do. However, if someone is publicly saying something that is false or creating division within the church, it may be necessary to call them out publicly. That's what Paul was doing here. And so after getting Peter's attention, how did he go about correcting him in his thinking? How did he go about offering correction in Christ? Well, Paul didn't do it in any kind of uh, arrogant or condemning way. And just folks, always keep this in mind that the purpose of confrontation is what? Restoration. Say that with me. The purpose of confrontation is restoration. Say it again. The purpose of confrontation is restoration. One more time. The purpose of confrontation is restoration. One for the road. The purpose of confrontation is restoration. (laughs) That's what this is all about. And as this passage continues, Bible students don't all agree on exactly where Paul's confrontation, his discussion with Peter ends, and where the letter where he's addressing the churches at Galatia picks up again. There are some differing views about that. And as you read different English translations of the Bible, you'll see the quotation marks are sometimes in different places. There are no quotation marks, by the way, in the Greek text, and so You just kind of have to look at it and figure it out by the context. As I read it, I tend to believe that Paul's words to Peter at least go through the end of verse 18 and probably to the end of the chapter. And so that's how I'm going to be treating this passage. And you can feel free to continue to figure that out on your own as as you study. And I would encourage you to do that. But at the end of the day, it really doesn't matter that much, though, because everything that Paul says here is built on and coincides with everything else that he teaches throughout the New Testament. And what he brings out in his correction to Peter 
is that in addition to denying and undermining the unity of the body of Christ, what Peter was actually doing was undermining and denying the doctrine of salvation by grace through faith alone. Because listen to what he says here in verse 15. We ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. Yet we know that a person is not justified by the works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law, because by the works of the law, no one will be justified. First important point, how many people have been made right with God by keeping the law of God? Zero. Zip. Ninguno. Nobody has ever been made right with God by keeping the law of God. Fact is, we don't do it. We, we, we fall short constantly. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We are all lawbreakers. So no one has ever been made right by keeping the law of God. And so as Paul is calling Peter out, he doesn't do it in an arrogant, prideful way, but he speaks to him through the truth of the gospel. He says, listen, Peter, how did you get saved? Think about it. We're not these Gentile sinners as we used to refer to them. But did we come, how were we made right with God? You and me are both Jews by birth, but the only way that we could be saved was through faith in Jesus Christ. The law that God gave to Moses couldn't save us. The law that God gave to Moses never saved anybody. The only way that anyone can be right with God is to put their trust in what Jesus did for them on the cross when he died in our place for our sin. He was buried and he rose again from the grave. But by pulling away from these non-Jewish believers who had come to Jesus by faith in Jesus, just as he had. What Peter was doing is he was actually acting hypocritically. He was being a hypocrite. He was acting as if one class of people are saved in one way, and another class of people are saved in a different way. And Peter was undermining the fact that salvation is through Jesus alone. And he was denying the fact that God saves everybody equally only through what Jesus has done. This kind of hypocrisy between Jews and Gentiles might seem pretty far removed from us. I don't know. There may be a few people in our congregation who have some Jewish blood. I don't know. Uh, Danos nodding his head. But do we not have distinctions of our own that we sometimes set in place that separate us or that we believe separates us from even from other believers in Christ? I mentioned race a minute ago. Seems like that one's always raising its ugly head. But I will just say that if you find yourself feeling repulsed or feeling a reservation about sitting down to eat and enjoy fellowship with another brother or sister in Christ who has a different skin color, different culture, different way of talking, then are you not doing the same thing that Peter was doing at the church at Antioch? Or if you feel that perhaps your intellect or your intelligence sets you apart from somebody else who perhaps isn't as smart as you are, and so that you just don't feel comfortable associating with them? Are you not placing another false division of superiority between you? I remember one time listening to a discussion about churches here in Covington, and someone referred to one church in Covington as being a blue-collar church, and another church as being a white-collar church. Are there any blue and white collars in the body of Christ? Notice mine's check it today. It's blue and white. I actually did that on purpose. But does God love people who work with their hands more than he loves people who work with their brains? Or vice versa? Or vice versa? 
All of us are saved, and we're only saved by the wonderful grace of Jesus. And without it, we're all equally lost. But sometimes we may think that is, and this is one I think that, that, that I have been guilty of at different times, is I'm a hardworking, country-living, God-fearing American. Does that ever make you feel superior? Have to admit, I've been guilty of that. Hard-working, God-fearing, country-living American. And because, I mean, just listen. You ever been in a crowd around here and you listen to somebody talk about, no offense, Dano from Brooklyn, but talk about, oh, he's a city slicker. <laughs> you know, and we can draw these, these false distinctions, you know, and sometimes we do it jokingly, but sometimes I hear people talk and it's not so jokingly. But there's this, and I know there's this tension sometimes between you know, all of these things that, that, that go on in the world and you hear the tension in the workplace. But the thing we need to remember is being a God-fearing, hard-working American has never saved anybody. And we are just as lost as the, as the foreign migrant worker who comes here to work or the, or the dude who sits there in his pajamas and plays video games all day or... Or the, the Hindu who is sitting by the banks of the Ganges River waiting for nirvana. Folks, we're all equally lost. But praise God, because of what Jesus did when he saves us, we're all equally saved to the glory of God. And how pitiful and how brash and how audacious is it for us to look at another brother or sister in Christ who has been saved by the same wonderful grace of Jesus that it took to save me and to feel like I'm somehow set apart from them or better in some way. This is what Paul was reminding Peter of. And as he continues to correct him, in verses 17 and 18, he says something here that can be just a little bit hard to follow. He says in verse 17, But if in our endeavor to be justified in Christ, we too were found to be sinners, is Christ then a servant of sin? Certainly not. For if I rebuild what I tore down, I prove myself to be a transgressor. Now I have often said, in fact, I said it a couple of weeks ago that it is my rock-solid belief that God wrote the Bible for common people to understand. But I have to tell you that when I read this, and I read it again, and I read it again, <laughs> I got up and I said, this common man doesn't have a clue what this means. <laughs> Honestly. I read it 20 times and I was still scratching my head. I felt a little bit better when I started reading commentaries and they all started on this passage with something like, this is a difficult passage. Or it's difficult to untangle Paul's logic in what he is saying here. However, I finally came across an explanation that was offered by William Hendrickson that seems to make a lot of sense. And he says this, he says, If the Judaizers are correct in maintaining that we in seeking to be justified solely in Christ and thus neglecting the law, turn out to be gross sinners just like the Gentiles, then would you say that Christ, who taught us this doctrine, is a sin promoter? In other words, what Paul is saying is, first of all, we teach that people are made right with God simply by believing in what Jesus did for us on the cross and not keeping the law of Moses. Are okay, you with me so far? Nod your head. Okay. But then, but what these Judaizers, these Pharisaical Jews were teaching, is they were saying, well, hey, if you, if you don't have to keep God's law to be saved, then you're abandoning God's law, and that makes us just as bad as these Gentile sinners. And that was the accusation that was being leveled at them. And the idea was that teaching salvation by grace alone was going to encourage people to sin. You have to have the law there. You have to have the law mingled in with that. 
in order to keep people straight. Well, Paul's answer to that accusation was this. Okay, if that's true, then what about Jesus? If you say that salvation by grace will lead people into sin, then what does that say about Jesus since he is the one who taught us this doctrine? Remember how Paul emphasized that his gospel came directly from Jesus Christ at the beginning of the book? He's saying, if you're saying that grace leads people into sin, what is that saying about Jesus? Does Jesus lead people into sin? And what's his answer? God forbid. May it never be. It's the strongest negative that exists in the language. And this, by the way, is what's at the heart of this thing called legalism. Legalism might pay lip service to grace. They'll say, of course, yeah, we're, we're saved by grace through faith. The Bible says so. But if you don't have the laws in there, people are going to go off the deep end. It'll lead to anarchy. It'll lead to licentiousness and loose living. And in a lot of ways, I, when I was small, that was kind of the envir church environment that I grew up in. The problem is, though, if you believe that the law is what makes people righteous and that God's grace promotes loose living, then you don't understand either the law of God or the grace of God. Because as we just read a moment ago, no one has ever been made righteous by keeping the law of God. And the corollary to that is no one has ever been led into sin through the grace of God. And this brings us to what it means to be crucified with Christ. This brings us to the crux of the matter where Paul, that same question Paul asked in chapter 1 and verse 10, am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Peter had been snared by the fear of man. But Paul is telling him, Peter, you can't have it both ways. You cannot be true to what Jesus taught us about grace and try to please these peddlers of legalism at the same time. You can't do that. If you claim to believe the gospel of grace and peace that we saw at the beginning of the book, the gospel of grace and peace that Jesus gave himself for our sins to save us from this present evil age, and then you turn around and you say, well, Jesus didn't quite finish the job. My friend, you either receive God's gift of righteousness, the righteousness of God. You either receive that as a free gift, or you don't receive it at all. You simply cannot have it both ways. You cannot try and add the works of the law or sacraments or clean living or anything else to what Jesus did on the cross. Listen to what Paul says here in, in, in Romans in the book of Romans, he says, for, oh no, in verse 19, excuse me, I'm getting ahead of myself. He said, in verse 19, he says, for through the law, I died to the law so that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. Look at what Paul says here. For through the law, I died to the law. You know, that's what happens when you get saved. In order to get saved, you have to die. Because that's what the law does. Paul said that through the law comes the knowledge of sin. And when we look at the law of God, all it does is kill us. We can't live up to it. I mean, I, I mentioned a few weeks ago, I can't even get through three of the Ten Commandments without being condemned. You shall have no other gods before me. I'm guilty. You shall not steal. I'm guilty. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. I'm guilty. You shall not covet. 
your neighbor's ox or his donkey or his wife or his maidservant or anything else that is your neighbor's. That's what you're doing. We're all guilty. There's, there's no denying it. The law kills us. And you have to die. To come to Jesus, you have to die to all of your self-effort, all of your self-righteousness, all of your self-sufficiency and self-reliance to make you right with God. All you can do is just fall on your knees and say, God, I'm dead. I am utterly condemned by what your law says. But I believe that your son died for me. He died for me. And when we die through the law and to the law, that's when we're set free to live unto God and for God because what happens is, as Paul says, we are identified with Christ in his death. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. It is no longer I who live but Christ who lives in me. You see, what Jesus did is he fulfilled the law in our place. And he took the weight of the law on his own shoulders and he took the penalty of breaking the law on himself and his body as he hung there between heaven and earth and God poured out his wrath for all of our law breaking. And that's what happened to the person that you used to be when you came to Jesus. You're crucified with Christ. And the life that you now live, you live through him living in you. And so as far as this idea that the grace of Christ promotes loose living, look at it this way. Which one of us is going to be more pleasing to God? The person who is focused on his own self-effort to keep a bunch of rules? You know what the Bible says about that, don't you? All our righteous acts are like what? Filthy rags? Folks, we're talking about the righteousness of God here. (laughs) We don't measure up. It's filthy rags. But then you compare that to a person who is covered by the holiness and the righteousness of God's own son and with his own spirit living inside of us to energize us and give us power. As Paul said in the book of Romans, God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do. By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. And so now with God's Holy Spirit, him having us washed us clean and covered us in the righteousness of his own son, his spirit living inside of us gives us that power to live like Jesus lived. And Paul's not saying that keeping God's commandments has no place in our lives today. On the contrary, remember Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Um, Boo and Dorcas were talking about 1 John. (laughs) Read the book of 1 John. That's what it's all about. A person who says, I love him but does not keep his commandments is a liar. And the truth has no place in him. And with the exception of keeping the Sabbath day, all of the Ten Commandments are repeated in the New Testament letters. But there is a very great difference between keeping God's commandments so that you hope that you can earn your salvation that way and and keeping God's commandments because you know that you already have been saved by his wonderful grace. You know that you're crucified with Christ and the life that you now live is through faith in him and it doesn't belong to you anymore. And notice how Paul makes this so personal. He says, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved What's that word? 
me and gave himself for me. You know, there's no way that you can think about that. No way that you can internalize that without it radically changing everything in your life. When you get up in the morning, I have to admit, when I put my feet on the floor, more often than not, the first thing I'm thinking about is coffee. But friends, when we put our feet on the floor, first thing we ought to be thinking about, I've been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. And the life I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And folks, that will transform your life more than trying to keep any list of rules that you might have. Christ loved me. He gave himself for me. When you're going to your job, when somebody's getting on your nerves, when, when, when something is going wrong in your life, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. And the life I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Verse we read a few weeks ago from the book of Titus, Paul said that the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all, training us to renounce ungodliness. That's what grace does. Grace doesn't promote loose living. Grace teaches us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled and upright and godly lives in this present age, waiting for our blessed home and appearing the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. And Paul finishes by saying, I do not nullify the grace of God. For if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. If there was any other way that we could be saved, if there was any way we could be saved by keeping these commandments and all of the requirements of the law, then, then God sent his son to this world for no purpose. And he died for no purpose. And if we claim to believe in Jesus and what he has done for us, Paul says to go back now and think that you can somehow add something to that. To make yourself more acceptable to God is in effect to nullify the grace of God. Well, this story does have a happy ending because from everything we read and Peter's first letter and in his second letter, one that I already mentioned where he makes reference to Paul as being his beloved brother. There's every indication that he received this correction that Paul offered him. In Christ, confrontation is always for restoration. As I close, just let me ask you, is there some way that you're nullifying the grace of God by pulling away from another brother or sister for any reason? Is there somebody here that maybe you just don't like for one reason or another? Are you nullifying the grace of God by somehow believing that you're superior to them in some way and forgetting how it took just as much grace for God to save you as it did them? Folks, we can't ever forget that. Jesus loves us all. He died equally for us all. And he saves us equally as well. Praise the Lord for that. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Once again, Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the privilege, of, the privilege of sharing it with these people this morning. And Father, I just pray that you will take this word that has been shared and that, Lord, people will dig into it, study some more, and that, Lord, you will use this truth in our life, Lord, to just to build a greater unity and a love among us for one another and greater understanding of what it means to be saved by your grace. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.